All right. It's 12 p.m. Are we supposed to start? Are you hearing me, Christine? Yes, I hear you. Okay, perfect. All right. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Christine Monsieur, uh, who is giving this uh, uh, talk at um, our, this uh, talk at the global Im the global immuno talk. Um, and um, and Christine obtained her her PhD from uh, so maybe I should have introduced myself. So I'm Miriam Marad. I'm one of the organizers of the Global Immuno Talk, and I'm supposed to introduce today's speaker. <clears throat> so uh, Christine Moussi obtained her uh, PhD from the University of Toulouse, France, uh, in uh, uh, Jean Philippe Girard's lab, where she identified the key role of dendritic cells in the recruitment of lymphocytes through the HEV in the lymph node. And that was a beautiful paper that, that was published in Nature and, and had a lot of press because uh, we thought that that recruitment was really recruited by many different cues, but, but not, not, we, no one had realized the, the dominant role of, of this small subset of immune cells in the recruitment of naive lymphocytes to the lymph node. Uh, and that was really the first time I, I really heard of Christine. It was many years ago. And since then, it was a beautiful paper. I tell her that all the time. She, had, she was the only author with her PI and it just struck me. And I followed her career since. So Christine then moved to Vienna to do a, a, a postdoctoral fellowship in Michael Six group. In, uh, and there she worked on the mechanism that controlled dendritic cells migration from the periphery to the draining lymph node. And in another highly visible paper published in Science, she discovered that a modification of CCR7, this chemokine receptor CCR7 or, pol or polycialylation of CCR7, was required to retransform a ligand or to release the one of its ligands, CCL29, from an inhibitory state and enable BC to sense uh, this gradient and migrate to the lymphatic, to the draining lymph node. So that was also highly visible because that migration from the periphery to the draining lymph node, migration of BC charged with antigen to the lymph node is key to both re maintaining regulatory response and, and, and priming any response against peripheral antigen. So two really beautiful study and we were wondering where she was going. I think I tried to recruit her sana at that time, but she decided to uh, move to Genentech. At that time it made sense and uh, uh, where she joined the cancer immunology department, which was led by Ira Melman. And there she became very interested in understanding the mechanism that restricts T cell recruitment or immune cell recruitment to tumor lesions, which is a key barrier for response to immunotherapy. And in a tour de force study that she published in Nature last year, she developed a high throughput in vivo imaging platform that enabled to implant simultaneously, simultaneously different tumor clone, white type or edited, and follow the organization of the micro environment and their response to immunotherapy. So that will provide really a platform to test different immunotherapy combination and really understand or correlate immune micro environment or tumor cues uh, and response to treatment. So in 2024, Christine became the therapeutic strategy lead for the TME in the Cancer Immunology Discovery Group at Genentech. And now why the future of the Cancer Immunology Division at Genentech isn't clear. What is clear to us is that your future, Christine, remains bright, and we hope that you'll be able to go back to the bench soon and continue your fight to identify novel immunotherapy modality to treat cancer. So thank you, Christine, for being here today. You know, this Global Immunotalk is really an extraordinary initiative from Elena and Carla to really share, you know, immuno knowledge, immunology knowledge with, uh, um, you know, the community across the world with an emphasis on those that are less exposed. So it's really an extraordinary initiative and we are ha very happy that you joined us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam, for this very kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to attend any events that are organized uh, by Miriam, but I'm also particularly proud of being part of this uh, global immunotalk uh, and free distribution of knowledge across the world. So um, I'm very happy to be here, and I hope to get people enthusiastic about recruitment and migration of immune cells in tumor. Um, should I share my screen now, or do you want to do the question? Okay. 
Go ahead, Christian, you can share. Okay. So as Miriam mentioned, I will present you the work we have developed in my group uh, for the past few years, uh, where we develop a new technology to image the tumor microenvironment in live in um, animals. And uh, we use that technology to understand the clue controlling tumor immune phenotype and uh, dynamics of immune responses in a tumor lesion in the skin of mice. Um, so as a disclaimer, I'm employee at Genentech and I own Roche stocks. Uh, so, first of all, what do we call tumor microenvironment and tumor immune phenotype? Uh, so, um, we know that solid tumors are uh, constitute of population of cancer, immune cells, and stromal cells with frequency and function that vary with time, and uh, this is called the tumor microenvironment. So, uh, we, people focus on uh, lymphoid cells, uh, most particularly, but we know that uh, TME is made of myeloid, uh, different subtype of myeloid cells, stroma, lymphatic vessels, blood vessels, fibroblasts, extracellular matrix, and more particularly, some soluble factors that can be uh, some uh, metabolites, cytokine, and uh, nutrient uh, gradients in the tumor. So as I mentioned, people focus on uh, cytotoxic T cells mostly and distribution of CD8 T cells, but we really need to keep in mind that all those uh, other components are part in the, of the tumor microenvironment. And even if we don't see them on videos, for example, they are still there in the background. Um, so we also know based on, on patient samples. So this is very important to go back and forth between mouse and human. And we know that uh, based on, on immunohistopathology of a patient tumor, solid tumor can be classified in three tumor immune phenotype based on CD8 T cell distribution. So the inflamed tumor present with CD8 T cells, you can see here in brown, that are infiltrating the core of the tumor. Immune excluded, the CD8 T cells are stuck outside in the stroma. And for immune desert, there is really little uh, recruitment of CD8 T cells into the tumor niche. We also know that based on indication, the proportion of this different immune phenotype vary. And um, why do we care about those tumor immune phenotypes? Uh, because we know that response to immunotherapy and more particularly response to checkpoint blockade uh, is uh, highly uh, enriched in tumors that are immune inflamed, in patients that have tumors that have an immune inflamed phenotype because this is a sign of an ongoing immune response. And um, we also know that immune desert and immune excluded tumor on the other side of the spectrum has the highest unmedical, unmet medical needs. So you can see here the incidence of those immune phenotype uh, is still a majority of tumor that are poor, not infiltrated or poorly infiltrated by uh, CD8 T cells. And um, we decided that we really need to try to unlock those immune inflamed and immune excluded tumor phenotype uh, to make them better respond to uh, immunotherapy. So our goal is really to convert those tumor from desert uh, to excluded and inflamed. And um, for that, we realized something very quickly when we started the lab is that despite the importance of this tumor immune phenotype in patients, both in prognostic and in predictive biomarker, little is known about their development, heterogeneity, or dynamics. And um, because I think that science, and this is an important point, when you want to push the science forward, you always have to go hand to hand with studying mechan biological mechanism together with a technological uh, uh, innovation. So we decided to develop a new technology to be able to uh, image uh, the tumor in vivo. And where that come from? So we realized that there is some uh, lack of good model uh, to be able to study the tumor microenvironment. There are models out there that we can use, such as from low complexity to high complexity, in, in vitro culture, in 2D uh, of immune cells, uh, co-culture of tumor immune, uh, cells in vitro. Uh, if you go a bit more higher in the complexity, you can develop some organoids with multiple components, um, uh, tumor cells, fibroblasts, uh, immune cells. Um, of course, there is some 
pro and con for those technologies. They can be high throughput. You can have them in a human and in a mouse system. Of course, the con, the, 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 the con in that system for the tumor microenvironment, this is not really a physiological environment. You don't have a lymphatic circulation, a blood circulation, an innervation. So uh, you need to move to a more complex model if you want to study the tumor microenvironment. And um, so you would move towards subcutaneous tumor, injection of cell lines, or orthotopic tumor models. Uh, and uh, going toward more complexity, again, you can use gem mice that uh, have driver mutation and develop, need months to develop tumor. And the final uh, one is a humanized mouse system, where the uh, immune system uh, of a human immune system is reconstituted in a mouse. All of that is better suited for immuno-oncology questions because you can have a priming, you have a tumor draining lymph node. Uh, however, this is low throughput, this is pretty expensive. And um, what is important to realize is mostly endpoint. So that means you inject a tumor subcutaneous, you harvest the tumor, and you uh, digest it, you go for the fax, for the flow cytometry, and you actually hope for pathology, histopathology, but you basically have an endpoint and you look at tumors that are growing. So you basically sample the tumor uh, failed rejection, right? But what happened in life for, um, for uh, tumors that are effectively rejected by the immune uh, system? And for that, we decided to create that technology that we call STAMP. And, um, this is a new model uh, that took quite some people to develop. And it's also something we emphasize a lot in our lab, that we need to work at the interface between bench scientists and computational scientists. So uh, this has been a tremendous effort from uh, three uh, uh, very good uh, uh, immunologists, web uh, lab scientists, and three computational scientists. Um, so we call it STAMP for Skin Tumor Array by Microporation. And um, uh, this uh, technology uh, implements a novel non-invasive high throughput imaging uh, to explore the spatial organization, the dynamics, and uh, the function of immune cells uh, in preclinical mouse model of anesthetized mouse. So how does that work? Uh, first, we use a laser uh, to create an array of pores on the skin of the animals. And we can choose this geometry of the array, the number and the density of pores, the depth. Uh, this is just a physical way to uh, open the barrier. Uh, and once you have this, created this array of pores, we can now uh, deposit tumor cells that are expressing a fluorescent reporter. In that case here is GFP. We seed the tumor cells in the small pores, and then we see that uh, a, GF, a tumor array develop over a week, more or less. And um, we also have done a, a single cell clone of these tumor lines to make sure that all the tumors that are seeded in the spore are genetically identical. Um, and then we perform live imaging daily, up to 30 days. And uh, we have developed an image processing uh, pipeline uh, that is uh, using uh, uh, automated segmentation and machine learning to track those different nodules over time. Uh, so you uh, can see here that uh, this tumor is going to be followed over time here and here. And the way we measure the tumor growth is by measuring the area of the GFP. And um, my screen is cool. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we need to develop an automated pipeline of image analysis because now we are analyzing several hundreds of tumors per animals. So, um, you don't really want to highlight manually those thousands of tumors uh, daily. So, what we have developed is a way to analyze that in an automatic way. So, we first start with two channels, the green channel, which is the tumor, GFP, and the red channel here that are the TD tomato T cells. So, this is a special distribution of uh, CD8 T cells in tumor uh, over time. So based on that, our first step is to perform a tumor segmentation. So uh, that means um, automatically the, the software will detect what is tumor and what is a normal adjacent, and then uh, detect those different tumor nodules over time. Then the second step is to do tumor tracking. It's great we have those different tumor nodules, but we need to link them together in time. And this is what we are doing here. You see the red nodule here is linked together. We just tell the software this is the same tumor. This is also done automatically. 
and each type we have a small module to do manual uh, co uh, correction, manual curation. Um, once we have tracked those tumors for each time point, uh, what we do is what we call a radial analysis. That means for each tumor, uh, we define the center and we uh, design, we, we uh, draw a radius that we spin around in uh, 360 degrees and we uh, represent the average fluorescence along that radius and that allow us to classify tumor as immune excluded, as you can see here, of the immune inflame as this tumor here. Oops, you don't see my pointer. Uh, so immune excluded here or immune inflamed. And now we have a 2D map of the special distribution of immune cells over time. And then we have uh, developed an interactive data analysis platform when uh, we can upload the uh, results of multiple experiments. And now we start analyzing several thousand of tumor uh, over time per treatment arm. So which type of parameter can we quantify? And um, this is just the beginning. We are developing version two of this uh, pipeline of image analysis. But uh, you can look at tumor growth curve. So uh, if you look at tumor area, the area of individual tumor of this array over the span of two to four weeks, uh, this is one individual tumor array of 114 tumor implanted in the same ear of an animal. You can see that some tumor are growing here in gray and some tumor are rejected. Uh, so that's our individual tumor growth curve. We also represent what we call uh, tumor survival. Um, so this is the survival probability of a tumor over time. And you can see here, if you implant those tumor in a, uh, in a immunodeficient mice, 100% of tumor will be growing. Uh, this curve represents Kaplan-Meier uh, survival probability of tumor over time with confidence interval. If you implant them in a wild type animal, you will see like 30% of tumor are getting rejected. And then, as I mentioned, we look at T cell infiltration. We perform this radial analysis uh, where we represent the average fluorescence along here the radius or the diameter. This is the center of the tumor. And you can see in blue is the average fluorescence of the tumor channel, and in red is the average fluorescence of the immune cell channel. And you can see here when there is an overlap of the immune and the tumor, this tumor is called inflamed. When there is an exclusion of immune cells outside of the tumor nest, this tumor is called uh, excluded. And uh, we not only characterize those tumor by category as inflamed or excluded, but we also now have a continuous variable um, that we can measure uh, of um, a ratio of uh, T cell abundance outside divided by T cell abundance in the core of the tumor. Um, so that's what we do with our uh, image analysis pipeline. And then um, that allows us, as I mentioned, to uh, represent several thousand of tumor trajectory over time, when we can look at tumor survival, individual tumor growth. We can look at total abundance of T cells in, in those nodules. Um, we can have an automated image uh, phenotype call, immune phenotype call, heat map over time that I will come back to it later, and some time series uh, uh, representation. So, okay, that's great, that's from the technology side, right? But what did we learn uh, with this uh, new technology? Uh, so what we learned, uh, the first thing that was uh, surprising to us is that if we implant this tumor array, and I remind you that those tumors are all clonal, so genetically identical, uh, in wild-type mice, we realize that 30% uh, of tumors are getting rejected. When if we implant them in RAC2 deficient mice, 100% of tumors are growing. And this is represented in that tumor survival plot, where in RAC2 mice, tumors are uh, persisting, and in wild-type mice, 30% of tumors are rejected. So we were very intrigued by that, because those tumors are implanted in the single animal with the same T cell repertoire, and uh, those tumors are clonally derived. So we were really intrigued by understanding what is mediating this local rejection. That means one millimeter apart, you have one tumor growing and one tumor rejected. Um, so the first question we have asked is that at, at all CD8 T cells or adaptive CD8 T cells dependent. So we have done multiple adoptive transfer of antigen specific T cells or bystander T cells. We have performed also CD8 T cell depletion. And the answer is yes, it is CD8 and CD4 dependent. And once we transfer by standard T cells uh, that do not have uh, uh, tumor specificity, uh, we basically uh, do not reject tumor. All the tumors are going here if we transfer OT1 T cells and the tumor does not express ovalbumin. We have done the opposite transfer. 
and then the tumor getting rejected. We also have done vaccination experiment with, uh, with constitutive tumor antigen, and it's always the same results, is CD4 and CD8 dependent. So um, if now we have a local heterogeneity of tumor fate, we are asking what's the driver of this heterogeneity. And um, for that, we wanted to image T cells across the tumor array. So what we have done, we took uh, RAC2 deficient mice uh, and we, uh, that, that are immunodeficient and we reconstitute them with uh, uh, wild type tomato, TD tomato T cells uh, and we implanted GFP positive tumor cells. Uh, and we also have done that in nude mice. And um, what we have seen is that across this tumor array, you can see here different tumor nodules have different tumor immune phenotypes. So here you have a tumor nodule, like it's a one millimeter tumor, uh, with a lot of T cells in the core. This tumor here has an excluded phenotype where T cells are uh, specially distributed and stuck outside of the nodule. This tumor here is desert. And then we define a fourth phenotype that we never looked at in patients, which is a rejected tumor. So we see that uh, over time, the GFP, the tumor cells will grow, but then the, this GFP will disappear. And then we have a small scar where T cells will actually stay in cluster for several weeks. Um, and um, so that allows us now to monitor an effective rejection. Uh, those sites can be identified, uh, those sites of effective rejection can be identified over time, and now we can biopsy. So we can biopsy in FEM excluded desert and rejected tumor and ask uh, which uh, tumor microenvironment is present in those nodules. Um, so the first question we have asked is, uh, we perform bulk RNA-seq, uh, punch biopsy of those tumor nodules and then bulk RNA-seq. Um, and we uh, realized that in the principal com component space, those tumor cluster together uh, per immune phenotype. And we wanted to uh, make sure that uh, this tumor immune phenotype is relevant for uh, human biology. So uh, we have compared uh, the, we have done a differential gene expression analysis and pathway enrichment uh, across immune phenotype and compare that with uh, human samples from our clinical trial. So we have looked at ovarian tumor, lung and bladder. And in the three cases, we found common pathways that are enriched in inflamed, excluded and desert tumor. Uh, and those pathways seems to be shared with this uh, mouse uh, skin tumor array model. So in inflamed tumor, we have an enrichment in interferon responses and uh, immune uh, signature and allograft rejection uh, pathway. Uh, in the excluded tumor, we have an enrichment in angiogenesis, hypoxia, uh, TGF beta signaling, epithelial mesenchymal transition myogenesis, and you will see later this is coming uh, from the uh, myocarp. Um, and in the desert tumor, we have seen an enrichment of wind beta catenin and a shock, which are a pathways that we know are, are enriched in cold tumor in patient. So this was important for us to say that this model was biologically relevant. Uh, even those tumor, also those tumors are pretty small. They seem uh, to recapitulate the biology of the tumor microenvironment that we can uh, find in patient. Um, and the question we are asking, if we see an heterogeneity in tumor fate and then an heterogeneity in T cell distribution, among those uh, nodules of the tumor array, what is controlling this uh, distribution, this uh, heterogeneous distribution? So the first thing we wanted to make sure is that this heterogeneity was not technology dependent uh, or organ dependent. So we wanted to look at in a more uh, constitutive settings where we have uh, injected our tumor cells or KPP GFP tumor cells IV uh, in the same mouse where it has been reconstituted with TD tomato T cells. And uh, we have harvested the wall lung, so it's a spontaneous lung metastasis model. We have harvested the wall lung, and then we have cleared this lung, and then we image those different nodules. And you can see here, you have different metastatic nodules. And clearly, the infiltration in red is very different. Some tumors are very cold, like this one, uh, or this one, and some tumors are very inflamed here. So this heterogeneity of tumor uh, immune phenotype exists not only in skin, uh, in instant, but also in a constitutive settings, in a metastatic setting. So we already know this is not, this seems to be existing in a constitutive setup. Um, so then we ask, what is controlling this heterogeneous distribution? So three options, uh, that could be the tumor cells themselves. So uh, as I mentioned, the tumor cells are genetically identical. We don't really know how much they can diverge in vivo. 
so that could be we seeding different type of tumors or they can evolve differently in the pores over time. That could be the quality of T cell infiltrate. So uh, maybe we are recruiting antigen specific T cell in one case and antigen in, and uh, by standard T cell in the other case. Uh, so um, we went to look into the T cell uh, infiltrate. Uh, or finally, that could be the tissue microenvironment. Uh, that means myeloid cells and stroma uh, present at the tumor site. That is controlling this uh, heterogeneous distribution of T cells and tumor outcome. So we tackle the first question, are tumor cells involved in this uh, uh, heterogeneous distribution of T cells? So for that, we have implanted different cell lines, uh, a melanoma B16F10 cell line, a PIDA KPP cell line, or non small cell lung cancer derived from a gem model, and uh, in this tumor array, and we looked at the proportion of tumor immune phenotype. And we realized, first of all, that this heterogeneity of inflamed, excluded, and desert immune phenotype exists across multiple models and multiple cell lines that have been implanted with stamp. And uh, we also uh, realized that the proportion of those tumor immune phenotype is different uh, uh, depending on the cell line we are using. And uh, some cell lines are enriched in more desert phenotype, other in a more uh, excluded phenotype. Um, however, uh, this local heterogeneity always exists. And uh, that tells us that tumor cells influence the probability of developing a certain uh, tumor immune phenotype, but they are not strictly deterministic. Something else that is local seems also to control uh, the distribution of immune cells. So, um, because this local heterogeneity exists across tumor lines, and we also have done, I don't mention it today, but we have done uh, uh, all exome sequencing, RNA-seq over time to see if the tumor are diverging in vivo, and we do not see that. Uh, at least they do not accumulate particular mutation over time. So, um, so the question, next question, we ask is are recruited T cells different in, in each of those tumor modules? So for that, we came back to our uh, skin uh, tumor array and we perform a punch biopsy and single cell RNA seq with TCR seq of the uh, TD tomato positive cells in those tumor nodules and uh, based on clustering and, uh, um, and relative abundance of the T cell subset. And uh, we didn't see any differences. Uh, uh, of the different T cell subset CD4 and CD8 uh, in uh, rejected versus inflamed versus excluded tumor. So uh, we do not see any enrichment of a particular subtype of T cells. And I, here we have been very early in the biopsy. So we know that T cells infiltrate around day six in this tumor array. Uh, and then we, the first day we can start looking at tumor immune phenotype is day seven or day eight. So uh, we started biopsies of tumor as soon as we can detect a tumor immune phenotype, a special distribution, and as soon as we can classify those tumor as inflamed, excluded, or desert. So that means we are pretty early after the T cell infiltrate. Uh, we're now looking at later time point because the, the trajectory of those T cells will diverge with time. But I can tell you that at early time point, at the time of infiltration of those T cells, uh, the quality of the T cell infiltrate is similar across inflamed, excluded, and uh, rejected tumor. Once we looked at TCR, uh, we find the same uh, abundance of the different clonotype. The repertoire of uh, recruited T cells seems to be similar. So it's not what is dictating the outcome, like the T cells that are in, in an inflamed and excluded or rejected tumor, at least at day eight, uh, are similar uh, uh, to each other. What we see, so the advantage of the system is because this is implanted in a single mouse, uh, we can ask the question, what happened to one particular clonotype of T cells that is going to see an inflamed versus an excluded tumor? And once we look at a pathway enrichment analysis, we realize that uh, the same clonotype of T cells that is seeding an inflamed tumor uh, show an increased translation of mitochondrial biogenesis signature, uh, which seems to, and several uh, also cytokine, so, which seems to tell us um, a hint that maybe T cells are functioning better in an inflamed tumor microenvironment than in an excluded tumor microenvironment. So, if I summarize our data till there, that tells us that you need to recruit, to, to have a good rejection, you need to recruit antigen specific T cells. You uh, need to have them specially distribute in a way uh, that uh, will uh, allow them uh, to, to infiltrate into the tumor nest 
But then what about their function, right? It's not only having T cells, it's not having, having them distributed in a certain way, but you also want to uh, check their function. So to check their function, we decided to uh, increase the resolution of our imaging. So everything I'd show you till now was an epifluorescence imaging, uh, where we could look at the whole tumor array at a, at a, in a single shot. So what we have done now is to zoom into each nodules on those tumor array, where we can now look at individual tumor cells and individual immune cells and by two photon imaging. So if you look here, this is different tumor nodule, and you can see in red here or in green here, you can now track individual T cells that are migrating inside your nodules, inside the tumor nodules. And we can also look at a collagen, extracellular matrix in blood vessels uh, to look at exit of those cells from the blood. So uh, looking at that, we can now zoom into a nodule and we wanted to get um, not only the behavior of the T cells and the migration capacity, but also the function of those cells. And the question we were asking is, are those cells able to attack uh, uh, the tumor cells uh, or are they uh, dysfunctional? So to ask that question, we have worked uh, with a talented postdoc, Alex Ritter, who had developed a calcium sensor uh, in uh, our tumor cells, where we, basically the tumor cells express the BFP, so they are blue at baseline, and then they express GCAM6, which is a calcium sensor. And each time a T cell here, TD tomato red T cell, is going to attack tumor cells. It's going to poke a hole in the plasma membrane, and uh, you, uh, a flux of calcium will enter the cell from the extracellular space, and then the tumor cells will turn green. So you will basically count the number of flashes of green and translate that at number of T cell attack. So what we see is that uh, if a tumor is desert, there is no T cell infiltration here, only in blue, there is little green flashes. If now a tumor is highly uh, infiltrated and uh, with a lot of T cells and attack effectively by T cells, this is a TDB dual engager as a positive control, you can clearly see that there is strong green flashes uh, in, uh, in some pockets of the, tumor, uh, of the tumor nodules. You also see that there is some heterogeneity, local heterogeneity. Some parts are more cold, so they don't really flash green. Also, there is a lot of T cells. Uh, and so we wanted to, what we have done is to develop a way to quantify these uh, calcium flashes, taking into account the number of flashes, the duration, and what we call a calcium flashing index. So uh, a high, uh, uh, calcium flashing index, a high flashing index is associated with a lot of T cells and a lot of tumor attack by cytotoxic T cells. Um, so once the question we ask, is there a difference between inflame and excluded tumor in terms of uh, T cell function? So uh, if we look at excluded versus inflamed tumor of the same tumor array, and here one dot is a tumor, and we look at uh, uh, mean fluorescence intensity of the TD tomatoes, that means the, only the abundance of T cells. There is not really a difference between an inflamed and excluded tumor. We see the same amount of T cells, and even sometimes we see a bit more T cell in an excluded tumor than in an inflamed. Uh, but now, when we look at the flashing index, that means the capacity to kill, uh, we see that inflamed tumors are enriched in, uh, in uh, functional uh, CD8 T cells that are able to attack tumor cells. So it seems that those T cells that I mentioned to you previously seem to have the same TCR repertoire. Uh, seems to function better in an inflamed tumor microenvironment. And we can now correlate that with tumor outcome, and effectively uh, that uh, the inflamed tumor here are going to be, uh, in, will, be uh, will be showing sorry, an increase in rejection rate over the excluded and the desert tumor. So if we summarize that, inflamed tumor have a higher flashing index and a higher rejection rate than excluded and desert tumor. So if those T cells are the same, the question we are asking now is what's supporting T cell function in an inflamed TM? Because this is where we want to bring the tumor toward, right? We want to make the tumor inflamed. So um, of course, the, the, the next uh, component we have been uh, studying is uh, the myeloid stroma circuits. So uh, for that, we decided to look at uh, which uh, myeloid cells and stromal cells are infiltrating those different uh, tumor nodules. And uh, so we turned back to our uh, punch tumor biopsy, where we looked at uh, myeloid cells and stromal cells by single cell RNA-seq. So um, what we have done is um, 
looking in detail into the subtype of myeloid cells or fibroblast over tumor immune phenotype. So what we see is that um, immune inflamed and immune rejected tumor, uh, you can see here in orange, have a higher relative abundance of monocyte derived cells, such as inflammatory monocyte, monocyte derived dendritic cells, and uh, here what uh, we call MHEC DC, which are those DC with uh, um, costimulatory marker and, and some maturation marker. Uh, so this is enriched in inflamed and rejected tumor. At the opposite, uh, in very cold tumor, desert tumor, we see an enrichment in uh, macrophages. So we see an enrichment in tissue resident macrophages, uh, in TREM2 positive macrophages. Uh, we also saw this uh, subtype of DC1 that has a particular transcriptome uh, that is to see to be enriched in desert tumor. Uh, if we looked at neutrophil, uh, there seems to be enriched in uh, excluded in flame and rejected tumor, but there is no uh, neutrophil infiltration in desert tumor. Uh, so that tells us that the myeloid infiltrate seems to be very different between an inflamed and rejected tumor versus a cold or excluded tumor. If we look now at the fibroblast, um, and we know myeloid cells have some plasticity. When we look from experiment, in between experiments, I would say this is reproducible. We always see more monocyte and dendritic cell in the inflamed and rejected tumor, but across experiment, we can have a bit of plasticity of those different subcluster. Uh, so depending on the timing of the experiment. But what was the most stable uh, phenotype uh, for single cell where the different subtype of fibroblasts? That seems to be pretty stable and the more reproducible phenotype. Uh, that's the biggest difference across uh, uh, those tumor micro environments. So we saw uh, different, we distinguished different subtypes of fibroblasts or cancer-associated fibroblasts. Uh, in the inflamed tumor, we, in, the, in, the, in the rejected tumor here, what uh, we have seen is that um, a subtype of fibroblast that we call chemocaf, chemokine-producing fibroblasts, and we did not call them inflammatory calf, so that's a question we often have, uh, just because we don't see them secreting inflammatory cytokine. Uh, so, um, we mostly see them secreting uh, chemokine and myeloid chemokine, I will show you. Uh, so, those chemokine producing fibroblasts are enriched in inflamed and rejected tumor. At the opposite, we saw some immunosuppressive fibroblasts enriched in desert and excluded tumor. With uh, a, a small uh, variation here, with, uh, we see a lot of uh, TGA beta, LARC15, MyCAF, uh, here expanded in excluded tumors, as those fibroblasts described by the Turles lab. And then we, dis we uh, distinguish another two other type of uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts in those cold tumor. Uh, that also seems to be based on transcriptomics, that seems to have uh, some immunosuppressive properties, but we are now trying to figure out if we can uh, identify those fibroblasts in uh, human tumors. Uh, so what I can tell is like, if you look at uh, receptor ligand interaction and different subtype of myeloid and fibroblasts, it's almost like each immune phenotype uh, is characterized by different units of uh, myeloid fibroblast uh, um, uh, components and uh, that are differently correlated with outcome. If we look again, I was mentioned as who is producing what, we realize that the myeloid cells, the monocyte and monocyte derived cells, are actually producing most of the uh, lymphoid chemokines, the T cell chemoattractants, CXL10 and CXL9. And uh, once we perform a ligand receptor pair interaction analysis, we realize that the chemokine producing calf here produce a lot of uh, myeloid attracting chemokine. And uh, as the opposite, the myeloid cells express this receptor for the chemokine. So we are in a scheme where fibroblasts secrete a lot of myeloid attractant, uh, a little bit of T cell attractant too, and the myeloid cells produce most of the T cell attractant. It's almost like a chain reaction. Uh, so this is just a correlation, right? So we now wanted to uh, ask about causality. What's the role of those myeloid cells and those uh, fibroblasts, cancer-associated fibroblasts, in the recruitment of T cell and the spatial distribution? Uh, so first, we have done some depletion experiment, uh, where in mice, we deplete neutrophil or monocyte of both of them, and we implant tumor at D0, and then we looked at uh, spatial distribution of T cells over time. And what we see is that when we deplete monocyte neutrophil, both of them, uh, we basically prevent T cell recruitment. So this is early tumor, right? So we are in the early events. We prevent T cell recruitment in the tumor niche, and we have an enrichment of desert tumor here in yellow, 
once we, uh, once we um, deplete uh, the myeloid cells. And this is a number of tumor analyzed per arm in a single experiment. And this is a small experiment. Uh, you will see later a bigger experiment. And um, how does that correlate with outcome? Uh, we also saw that if we deplete uh, those monocyte derived cells, we basically prevent tumor rejection. So it seems that those APCs, those uh, stimulatory um, uh, monocyte derived cells, uh, uh, seems to be important for uh, recruiting T cells and mediating re rejection. What about fibroblasts? So there, uh, we use a new mouse model that have been developed by the Turley lab. Uh, that allow us to deplete uh, fibroblasts using a DPT cream mouse and a DTR system where we inject diphtheria toxin and then uh, we can ablate uh, the uh, fibroblast of the skin. And what we see is that when we ablate those fibroblasts uh, at tumor implantation, we basically enrich in immune cold tumor again, in desert tumor. This is looking at T cell distribution, right? So those, we have less recruitment of T cells. But once we looked at the recruitment of myeloid cells, uh, so you can see here in this image, you have less T cell recruitment in red, right? So this is fibroblast depleted tumor and control tumor. And we see less T cell recruitment once we deplete the fibroblast. But once we look at the myeloid cells, we also saw that once we deplete the fibroblast, to decrease the recruitment of um, uh, dendritic cells, conventional dendritic cells and monocyte derived cells. Um, so that seems that, um, Depletion of fibroblasts will also shift your tumor toward the desert phenotype. So if we put that in perspective in a model, what did we learn from this uh, stamp array about early tumor rejection? So those rejections arrive, uh, happens around day 12 to 15. Uh, and um, what we see is that what, what we think is happening, once we see tumor cells with uh, uh, our laser and our skin tumor array, the skin fibroblast will be uh, perturbed and can develop in two different trajectories. One is uh, differentiating toward the chemokine producing cancer associated fibroblast, producing a lot of myeloid chemokines that are going to recruit monocyte and dendritic cells, and, uh, and uh, that are going to produce uh, uh, lymphoid chemokine to attract uh, activated T cells and leading to tumor rejection uh, starting day 10 to day 15. And uh, so on the other side, if those uh, fibroblasts are going to develop toward the TGF beta calf, uh, my calf, then uh, the tumor will start progressing and uh, instead of rejected, and they will um, develop more an excluded phenotype. Um, so the last part of my talk, I wanted to show quickly how we evaluate cancer immunotherapy with that model and what we can learn. Uh, from the biology of uh, uh, dynamics of immune responses during cancer immunotherapy. Uh, so for that, we took the example of a combination treatment uh, of anti-TGF beta and anti pdl one As you saw, you remember maybe in my first slide, in one of the first slides, I mentioned that um, excluded tumor and has been shown by other people in the field were enriched in uh, TGF beta signaling uh, in STAMP. So what we have done, we used mice that have been implanted with stamp a skin tumor array by my corporation in a control arm, or treated with anti-TGF beta single agent, or treated with anti pdl one single agent, or treated with a combination therapy. Here is the number of tumors that have been analyzed per arm. And what we can tell once we look at total T cell abundance over time, so one dot is one tumor here. Uh, we can say that both anti pdl one and combination therapy recruit, antigens, uh, recruit a lot of T cells um, over time, uh, and TGF beta alone is not able to do that. However, uh, so if we looked at uh, overall tumor survival and efficient rejection, only here in red, the combination treatment is going to effectively reject tumor. So that tells us that increasing T cell abundance is not enough to reject tumor, right? In both, both cases, there's an increase in T cell abundance, However, only in the combination treatment of anti pdl one anti tgf beta, there is an efficient tumor rejection. So, um, because total abundance is not, uh, is not sufficient of T cells, we ask, what about the spatial distribution of those T cells? And, um, and what about the dynamic of those tumor immune phenotype over time? So, um, for that, we have performed a, a heat map analysis. So, what we have done here is we looked at 1,200 tumors over time, over 30 days. Uh, this is a 30 days period. And then one line is a tumor trajectory, the tumor life, basically, inside the same array. And 
along this uh, line of, uh, of tumor trajectory, we can look at different parameters. We can look at tumor growth rate. So in red, is, the tumor is growing. In blue, the tumor is regressing. We can look at total T cell abundance when there is a lot of yellow, there is a lot of recruitment of T cells. And we can also look at tumor immune phenotype over time, inflamed, excluded, or desert tumor. So here the tumor is excluded and is transitioning to an inflamed. Here in yellow, this tumor is desert, it's wall life, right? And if we perform an unsupervised clustering, we can see of those trajectories that responding tumor, a tumor that are going to regress here in blue at some point are going to cluster together. They are associated with the high infiltration of T cells. And now we are asking what's happened to those transition of tumor immune phenotype, because by eye is not easy. We see all kinds of transition, desert excluded, excluded desert, desert in flame. So it's difficult for us to, uh, to it was difficult for us to, to figure out how to better quantify and better represent that. And we have been going back and forth with different ways to represent it, but the way we have done, um, uh, we are doing it now is uh, looking at tumor trajectory uh, over time. So what does that mean? Uh, so one gray line here is the tumor trajectory. And then we looked at two different parameters, a bit the same way we do a flow cytometry plots. We looked at the total T cell abundance along uh, this tumor trajectory and the infiltration ratio. So that means when the, the tumor moves towards that direction, the T cells infiltrate into the core. When the tumor moves in that direction, it recruits a lot of T cells. And then uh, in an unsupervised clustering, we have the software to distinguish different behavior of tumor, and we can identify three class of behavior. Uh, the first behavior is a tumor that are starting as this. So, and here, the line you can see here is the average tumor trajectory for this class, right? So you start at day eight and then all the way to day uh, 20. Uh, you can see that in this class, tumor start desert and be, recruit a lot of T cells, but they stay excluded. Uh, in this class, tumor recruit a lot of T cells and become inflamed quickly. And in this class, tumor uh, uh, recruit a lot of T cells, become excluded, then inflamed. And if we correlate that with tumor survival, we can clearly see that only this class number two is efficiently rejecting tumor. So that tells you that um, for an efficient tumor rejection, uh, you need to recruit T cells, but those T cells need to infiltrate the tumor core pretty quickly. If the tumor is excluded for a certain time, then become inflamed later in time, the rejection is not efficient. So it's almost like, um, the dynamic of spatial distribution of T cell is important, but it's almost also like the tumor microenvironment could keep a memory. Something happens when the tumor is excluded too long that maybe T cells become dysfunctional, and uh, there is an imprinting of the tumor microenvironment history that is going to be important for the tumor outcome. Uh, so, what happens in those different treatment arms? So, if you look at control anti TGA beta, anti PDL1, and, and combination treatment, you can see that the control tumor just don't move much. They're still in this low left quadrant. Anti-TGF beta the same. The anti-PDL1 treatment I told you was recruiting a lot of T cells, but those tumor actually stay excluded. You can see like they increase the total T cell abundance, but they don't increase the infiltration ratio. In the combination treatment, they increase the same T cell abundance, but now this T cell infiltrate into the core and then become uh, an inflamed tumor. Um, Um, uh, so we think that those trajectory of becoming quickly inflamed is very important to support T cell function. That means you need to recruit the right T cells in the right tumor microenvironments, the special distribution. And uh, in time, it's also very important that the T cells that infiltrate find a supportive niche at the moment of infiltration, or if they stay too long with a dysfunctional a niche that has an excluded tumor that will become quickly dysfunctional. So that means there is a time window that is very important for those newly primed T cells, uh, those effector T cells to see the tumor to stay functional, right? And that probably tells you, uh, that probably is the reason why an inflamed tumor in patient at treatment time, it seems to be a good pronostic of responses and, and uh, to treatment. Because the new T cells that you are going to generate are going to see the, a supportive niche for their function. And if we summarize that on a scheme, uh, it tells you that um, un systemic immunity is good, it's great. You need to, to prime the right antigen-specific T cells. However, when they leave the blood and they get into the tumor, what happens in the tumor side seems to dictate outcome, like the myeloid fibroblast circuit present in the tumor nodules. 
uh, is going to control if the tumor is going toward rejection or progression. High chemokine producing fibroblast monocyte dendritic cells, IT cell abundance, and only conversion to inflame is associated to rejection. At the opposite, low chemokine producing fibroblast monocyte, low T cell abundance, and excluded or desert or late conversion to inflame is going toward progression. And what immunotherapy is doing is just pushing this trajectory of rejection forward and increasing the chance of rejection. And uh, so this is in mouse, right? So we wanted to figure out as those transition, so those tumor immune phenotypes are dynamic in vivo. And uh, is it true also in patients? So uh, for that, we have looked at uh, resection and tumor biopsy of the same uh, lesion, which is never exactly the same cells over time, by histopathology. And we saw that uh, in different indication, uh, before checkpoint and after checkpoint therapy, we can clearly see that there is a change in tumor immune phenotype in patient. And those transition happen in all direction again, the same thing we have seen in the mice, some tumor transition from desert to excluded, desert to inflamed, excluded to desert. So um, because it's static and we're not sure that, that we are looking at the exact same cells, what we have done uh, is um, working with uh, a group in the Netherlands, uh, the De Vries lab, um, that is using an anti-CD8 PET imaging tracer uh, that allowed to do live imaging of CD8 T cell infiltration in tumor in patient before and after checkpoint blockade. So here you're looking at the exact same lesion. Uh, and you can clearly see here in, um, in orange that those tumor become infiltrated by CD8 T cells here in a ring pattern. So this change in tumor immune phenotype happened in patient too during checkpoint blockade. And we also was wondering, uh, can we see an heterogeneity of tumor immune phenotype inside the same patient with different tumor nodules, with different metastasis sites? And the answer is yes, here this is a triple negative breast cancer. This is a primary lesion which is hot with a lot of T cells infiltrated in flame tumor. And then the pleural lesion or the lung lesion here are much more cold. So this is hot, intermediate and, and pretty desert tumor. So in the same patient, you can have different nodules with different tumor immune phenotype. And once you look at the transition during checkpoint blockade, all kinds of transition happen uh, for those tumor nodules. And some tumor become inflamed, some tumor be become a desert, and those lesions seems to be also evolving independently from each other. Uh, so that's something that we need to be taken into consideration uh, for patient treatment is the dynamic and the heterogeneity of lesion in tumor immune phenotype. And why we think it's important for immunotherapy? Uh, yeah, so we think that leveraging the tumor microenvironment is going to be an important piece of, of uh, of, um, of information and, and, and therapy to, lever, to, to, to improve the response to cancer immunotherapy. So people who work on vaccine or T-cell modulator uh, or T-cell therapy, their goal is to leverage natural immunity or synthetic immunity to generate a lot of circulating tumor-specific effector cells, right? Those cells will expand and circulate in blood. However, when they're gonna see the tumor microenvironment, they're gonna find the same bottleneck. Uh, this tumor microenvironment with a lot of stromal cells, myeloid cells, soluble clue that are uh, toxic for the immune cells um, are going uh, to be controlling the uh, local T cell recruitment, but also T cell function in solid tumor. So this tumor microenvironment is a bottleneck, is a bottleneck for solid tumor. And it's also, as we can see, we have seen previously controlling outcome of uh, immunotherapy responses. So the future is probably a combination of leveraging T cell um, uh, targeted therapy with tumor microenvironment targeted therapy to improve responses uh, in uh, solid tumor. And that, uh, uh, that lead to an updated cancer immunity cycle. Uh, so the initial immunity cycle that everybody known that has been described by Ira Melman and Dan Shen in 2013 was describing the seven step of priming an adaptive immune responses uh, in tumor going from antigen release in the tumor uh, uh, upload of an antigen in dendritic cells, migration to the tumor dendritic lymph node, priming of antigen-specific T cells, trafficking of activated T cells to the tumor site, and then T killing of tumor cells by T cells at the tumor site. And um, this was the old cancer immunity cycle. And now, uh, thanks to uh, Tom Powell and Shannon Turley, they have uh, performed an updated tumor immunity cycle with uh, an emphasis on the tumor microenvironment. In flame excluded and desert tumors, those T cells, when they seed into the tumor, is not only they seed and they kill, uh, what is going to happen, this, their function is going to be controlled by the local uh, clue. 
uh, in, in desert tumor, a lot of um, uh, toxic environment, no endocrine tumor, no disease, no antigen presentation, uh, lack of antigen like low TMB, but also low antigen presenting cells and, and low antigen presentation on the tumor cells, low MHC1. In the excluded tumor, a lot of mica, TGF beta, and uh, extracellular matrix that seems to prevent T cell infiltration in the core. And then in the inflamed tumor, a lot of interferon, chemokine, and TLSs that are very important and attracted a lot of, uh, of, of um, interest over the past years. So the main question for the field, and I don't have time to go into it, is really, I encourage you to read those uh, three reviews, is how to tailor therapeutic to tumor immune phenotype in patient. I mentioned we have three different immune phenotypes with bottlenecks that are different, right, in each tumor immune phenotype. In the inflamed tumor, we have a chronic stimulation of T cells. T cells become exhausted, a lot of T regs. So checkpoint blockade, T reg depletion uh, would be a good therapeutic approach here. In excluded, we have a lot of dysfunctional stroma uh, with uh, a lot of extracellular matrix, and then interfering with this stromal biology will be important. In desert tumor, is more an ignorance, a lack of, lack of priming, a lack of antigen presentation, no endocrine features, uh, lack of dendritic cell infiltration. So here you really need to restore priming and recruitment of T cells. And um, so, okay, now what are the next steps for, uh, uh, for the tumor microenvironment? What are we working on? Uh, we are working on going beyond CD8 T cells and looking longitudinal imaging of other TME components, looking at fibroblasts, blood vessels, neurons, dendritic cells, tissues and macrophages, monocyte-derived macrophages, uh, hypoxia, uh, and developing sensors for different uh, uh, aspects of the tumor microenvironment. And um, the idea is, can we go beyond the, the definition of CD8 T cell distribution for tumor immune phenotype? Uh, so for example, if we look at special distribution of myeloid cells now, this is CD1 C positive cells, you can also see some inflamed and excluded phenotype. And uh, what does that mean for the tumor, right? Uh, and uh, that's the work of Kate Carboni, a, a bright postdoc in, in our department. And what she's doing is she's looking at different distribution of DC and T cells in tumor. And she's also uh, looking at, by laser capture, are uh, understanding deeply the tumor microenvironment in those tumors that are T cell excluded, DC excluded, T cell inflamed, DC inflamed and looking at different chemokine landscape and extracellular matrix deposit. So this is all in the cooking. Uh, she will have her lab very soon, so um, uh, reach out to her if you need. Uh, and uh, just to summarize this new model of, uh, we develop a new model to study the tumor microenvironment. The technical advantage is high throughput, longitudinal. Uh, you can study the microenvironment and uh, perform high uh, resolution imaging. And the, we learn from an efficient CIT induced tumor rejection with multiple biological applications, and uh, to, which is studying cell dynamics, target discovery, in vivo genetic screen, mm. tumor evolution, mode of action of therapeutics. And what we want to do is to integrate all of those information in a map, in a, a pathological map of the tumor microenvironment, where we not only track tumor outcome and integrate the spatial distribution of all those immune cells, but also integrate single cell, RNA-seq, and we are performing CRISPR screen to interfere with the TME and see which pathway are important. And once we put all of that um, clustered in the multidimensional space uh, using our STAM mouse model and correlate that with uh, a human uh, TME, we can probably leverage, uh, uh, understand better which pathway are controlling each tumor immune phenotype and how to intervene uh, with it. And that is the acknowledgement of the whole team, uh, a small group that have uh, done a tour de force of developing this technology and continue doing some great work, uh, regardless of what will happen for us in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine, uh, very much for a wonderful and inspiring talk. So, unfortunately, there is no live questions, as you guys know. You can only ask questions uh, to Christine, not only because it's a celebrate platform through the Global Immuno Talk X account. So, she will, as it is, uh, I think, explained in detail here. and. Christian hopefully will take the time to answer at least some questions. Yes. All right, so with this, I think we end uh, this Global Immuno Talk session. And I remind you that the next uh, talk uh, will be held on September 18 and given by Nicola Gondendio, who is in fact from the same institution that Christian is from. You guys are from the same place, right? Yes, yes, yeah, we are from the same place. 
It's, a, it's going to be a great talk. Go listen to uh, him. <laughs> fantastic guy. He'll be talking about mass cells. Uh, I think mass cells from fetal imprinting to, to childhood eczema. Fantastic guy. So look forward to seeing you all uh, at the next Global Immuno Talk. Thank you, Christine, again for your time today. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Ciao. Ciao.